Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, today's event is part of the York Festival of Ideas. Now in its eighth year, the festival aims to enhance York's reputation as a city of ideas and innovation through offering the highest calibre of public events. One of the largest free festivals in the UK, it delivers a diverse and inspiring programme for all ages to local, regional and visitor audiences. The 2018 festival is our biggest to date, with over 200 mostly free events presented under the banner of Imagining the Impossible. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope you enjoy the adventure that we're about to take you on. Now, let's get back to the reason that you're all here, quantum technology. So, for many of us, quantum science is akin to magic. Strange things happen at the quantum scale, which bear little relation to our experience in everyday life. Venturing into quantum science feels like Alice venturing down the rabbit hole and discovering that all the usual certainties no longer apply. And yet, this strange world provides the foundations for everything around us, and increasingly, it provides the building box for exciting new technologies that are transforming our lives. Today, we're going to learn about some of those new technologies and discover what the quantum future might hold. And I'm delighted to be able to welcome four of the UK's foremost experts on this topic to come and share their insights with us and whet our appetites for a quantum future. Before I welcome the experts, I'd like to explain how we plan to structure this session. Um, to begin with, one of our guests will give us an overview of quantum science in the UK, and then Another of our guests will give us an introduction to some of the fundamentals. And then each of our guests is going to present their quantum vision for the future and tell us about the possibilities that excite them most. And finally, I'd like to hand over to all of you, the audience, and offer you the chance to quiz them about your burning questions. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our four esteemed guests, all of whom play a major role in the UK National Quantum Technologies Programme. Um, so first we have Professor Tim Spiller, who became founding director of the York Centre for Quantum Technologies in 2014, and he's now also director of the UK Quantum Communications Hub. He's spent 35 years researching quantum theory, superconducting systems, and quantum hardware and technologies. He's an inventor on 25 patents linked to quantum technologies and applications, and was additionally a consultant inside Hewlett-Packard on networking, communications, and nanotechnology. Next to Tim, we've got Professor Winifred Heisinger, who heads the Sussex Iron Quantum Technology Group, and is director of the Sussex Centre for Quantum Technologies at the University of Sussex. He produced the first iron trap microchip, microchip in the world, and more recently, his group developed a new generation of quantum microchips featuring world record specifications. In 2016, he and his group invented a groundbreaking new approach to quantum computing, where voltages applied to a quantum computer microchip can replace billions of laser beams, which would have been required in previous proposals of how to build a quantum computer. He recently published the first practical blueprint for building a large-scale quantum computer, and his group is now working on the construction of such a device. Sitting along from Winnie is Dr. Joe Smart, who's been project manager for the Quantum Technology Hub in Sensors and Metrology at the University of Birmingham since 2015. The aim of her group is to translate state-of-the-art technology into deployable practical devices. They're developing smaller, cheaper, more accurate, and energy-efficient components and systems to build and sustain a supply chain which will have a potentially transformative impact across business and society as a whole. And last but not least, we have Professor Steve Beaumont, who's director of Quantic, the UK Quantum Technology Hub in Quantum Enhanced Imaging, and Vice Principal Emeritus at the University of Glasgow. His expertise is in the field of quantum imaging, and he hopes 
to enable us all to see through walls and around blind corners in the future. So can I ask you all to put your hands together and welcome our guests. Now, we're going to kick off with Tim giving us an overview of quantum technology in the UK. I'll hand over to you, Tim. Thank you. A bit worried getting applause before we've said anything. <laughs> a bit presumptuous. We're not going to spend hours talking at you, OK? But I want to try and give a bit of background, and then we're each going to give uh, a little bit of information about the, the kind of things we do. And then I hope we'll get some, some, some questions, and we can, we can start the discussion rolling. So. First thing I, I, I want to say a little bit about, Christmas came early in 2013 for the UK quantum community, and, and the then Chancellor of the, uh, the coalition government, uh, George Osborne, found £270 million pounds of, of funding, and there's been various bits added to it, but, uh, but this was additional funding, so it flows through our actual, uh, the usual routes for research funding, but this funding is not for research. This funding was extra, and it was found for technology development, and... The program started uh, uh, about a year later, and so it's a five-year program, so we're, we're running until towards the end of next year, and then we'll be looking to see if we can get some further funding to keep this going. But, but, but the idea was to, to basically develop new technologies based on the quantum research that's already been done. And so uh, there are various stakeholders in it. You can see all the various people that are contributing to the funding at the bottom. And... What this funding supports is, is quite a long list of things. I'm not going to talk you through them all in any detail. The top one is the most important one, and there, are, there were four hubs that were funded. So by hub, although, for example, I lead the one from York, our hub has eight universities in it, uh, numerous companies, the National Physical Laboratories. So each of the hubs in the UK is a big spread-out entity that sits all over the UK and is a big collaborative project aimed at technology development. So there are four of those funded, and we've got representatives from each of the four hubs uh, talking about the various technology sectors, uh, which we'll get to in just a bit. Then there were other things, the Centres for Doctoral Training Funding, PhDs, and uh, the National Physical Laboratory, which is our national measurement lab that lives at Teddington uh, near London. Uh, that got a major investment as well. So this 270 million is being spent in numerous different ways. But in terms of the technology development, we're going to try and give you a flavour of what's going on, uh, and then, then we can have a discussion about where, where this is going in the future. So these are the four hubs that were funded. I'm from the bottom one. Steve is from Quantique there. Joe is from the top one, and Winnie is from Enkit. And you actually are in the other one as well, aren't yes. you? You're in the one at the top. <laughs> so he's, he wears two hats, not just one. So, so those are the four. These hubs were chosen to cover different technology sectors. So we've got imaging, and we've got sensing, and we've got computing, and we've got communications. So quantum can play in all of these spaces, and we'll try and give you a, uh, an overview of, of what's going on. So those are the four hubs. Before that, we were asked to try and give you a little bit of an introduction to the underpinning quantum, because we always find that whenever we start telling... So we, we've tried to train ourselves to tell people what this technology can do rather than how it works, because we think that's how they should appreciate it. But we always find that people are still interested in how it works. So we'll try and give you a bit of the how it works, but we really want to try and communicate what it will actually do in the future. So I, I've just got a couple of slides to try and communicate that. So the first one is to do with this... So, the interesting thing about all these quantum technologies is that it's fundamental features of quantum physics. So when I first went to university, we didn't know anything about this. So I went off to learn physics, and all of these wonderful quantum features were really interesting, but I had no idea that they were going to be playing center stage in technologies by now. So when I learned about this stuff in the first case, there was no technology context on top of it, but there were these weird and wonderful features of, of quantum physics, which are now underpinning technology. So the first one I want to mention is superposition. Quantum things can take different paths to get to the same endpoint, or they can be in different states at the same time. And the hand-waving is that if, if you can do that in a computational sense, you can do lots of computations in parallel. And Winnie will be telling you more about that, because that's his domain. So Superposition, the thing that quantum stuff can be in more than one state at the same time, means you can, 
do computing in some sense in parallel. So that means better computing. And there's lots of applications, and Winnie's going to be telling you about some of the ways that these things are made. So, so that's the first thing. Superposition is going to lead to better computational technologies. Next thing is, as well as superposition, there, there's this weird property called entanglement, where quantum systems can be linked together with stronger correlations than you can possibly have in, in, in everyday life, for example. And these, these correlated things, or indeed other interesting quantum states, can be used to sense and image things rather more uh, subtly and right down to the most fundamental limits. So basically, interesting quantum states of various sorts enable both better sensing and better imaging. And you're going to be hearing about applications in the sensing and imaging uh, regimes in due course. And people use light for imaging. They use atoms and various other things for sensing. So you'll hear a bit about that a bit later on. This one's mine. This is, this is my domain. Quant quantum things are, are very, very delicate, if you like. Because if you try and look at one, you will inevitably disturb it. So, and that's built into nature. It's not just that we're a bit clumsy at the minute and that will improve in the future. It's a fundamental property of nature that when you try and ask a question of a quantum system, you will disturb it. And that disturbance, hand-wavingly, enables you to see where anyone's looked at signals that you've used and, and sent. So it sort of gives you a way to see if anyone is trying to eavesdrop. And so it gives you a way to to communicate securely, because you can find out, if you send quantum things around, you can find out if anyone's tried to have a cheeky look en route, uh, because they will have disturbed some of your signal. And you can detect that, therefore you know, uh, you know whether uh, someone's had a look or not. And so we use light for our quantum communication. So that's a quick, I hope that that's just given you enough to start asking us questions later on. But that's. That's the flavor. We've got superposition, we've got entanglement and other interesting quantum states, and we've got disturbance of, of things when you measure them. So these are the fundamental <coughs> features that underpin the new quantum technology. So I'm going to say just now, I'm going to give my little bit about the quantum communications now, and then I can hand over to Winnie. So in, in the hub that's developing technologies in, in the quantum communications arena, we know this already works. We can send signals over up to, let's say, 100 kilometers of optical fiber or even through free space. And we can use those signals to set up keys that can then provide secure communication or various other applications. So we know that works already. And if you remember, I said this, this money, the funding that was given for this UK technology program, is not to do more research. It's to, it's to improve the technology. So, so the top three things are what we're doing basically taking the technology that already exists and works, it's a bit clunky and big and, and bulky and quite expensive, and we're trying to make it better in various ways. So we're trying, to, we're trying to build quantum communication systems where one end of it could be built into your phone in the future and the other end could be owned by your bank or your employer or whatever. And so you can, you can establish keys that you can use for secure communications or entry or or financial transactions or whatever. So basically, quantum communications in your phone in the future. That's one of the technologies we're pursuing. We're also trying to put everything on chip. So rather, rather flippantly, if you've got a big box like this at the minute, which is roughly the size of either a quantum transmitter or a quantum receiver, we want to put them right down on chip. There will be some additional peripherals, but we want to shrink shrink both ends of the communication link right down. And then there's a possibility for integrating them into our conventional communications uh, networks. In order to prepare for that, we're building, and there's a little map over here, we're building a, a, a quantum network in the UK. So there's a little network running around Cambridge. There's one running around Bristol. It doesn't come up to York, unfortunately, because we don't have the national dark fiber infrastructure that's coming all the way up here. But we're building a quantum network. So this is going to actually demonstrate how this communications technology can work in the real world over proper, ordinary communications fibers. So we're, as I say, we've got a little network round in Cambridge. We've got a link to British Telecom down at, at Martlesham near Ipswich. And we're hoping to link down through London and all the way to our, our collaborators and, and colleagues in Bristol. So, so we're actually building that, 
that as we speak. And the bit, actually, this Wednesday, the Cambridge part of the network is going to have its official launch because that's been running for a while now. So, so those are three things that we're doing uh, in terms of quantum communication technologies. We're also doing a bit of what we've called next generation stuff. So that's as close as we get to research in our hub where we're looking to do things that go beyond simple key distribution. So the analog of digital signatures and things like that, which you can also have in the quantum world. So that's just to give you a little flavor of the technologies that we're developing in, in the quantum comms area. I can bring this link up again at the end if, if people really want, but there are various, there are various, uh, there are various things that you might want to go. If you're interested in following up, the top one is our hub URL, but the national program, which is administered through EPSRC, has a website, and we've got a new website up and now, which is all four hubs are contributing to called Quantum City. So if you're interested, I'd, I'd encourage you to go and explore that. If you want a bit more technical stuff, there's a big PDF on the web that you can get. So there was a, bit, there was a big government white paper, if you like, on quantum technologies that was written a couple of years ago that we all contributed to. So if you want to read a bit more detail at the next level, then, then I'd point you towards that. So, so that's me done, and I'm going to hand over to Winnie now to talk a bit more about quantum computing. So I Waiting? Oh, perfect. Here we go. Okay. So, um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about quantum computing. So um, let's start by telling you a little bit about our hub. So as, as uh, Tim already mentioned, there's, there's four hubs. Um, I'm here to represent the quantum computing hub, even though I'm actually also in, in the other hub developing portable quantum sensors, but may, maybe you can tell you about this a little bit later. So within the NCIT hub, there's, there's, you can see there's a whole number of academic partners and a whole range of industrial partners. So this is really something where we need to work together with industry in order to build these tremendous machines. So within the NCIT hub, we're developing two uh, quantum computer prototypes. So these machines are tremendously hard to build. And so what we're doing now is, is building prototypes to show that they, they actually can work and to prove the technology and then go ahead and actually build large scale machines. So this is my group at the University of Sussex, just to give you a bit of a feeling of, of what it actually takes to, to, to make something like that happen, how many people, and I'm very lucky to, to have that. And at Oxford University, there's, there's equally many in, across the partner universities. So you can see uh, that there's really a lot of people required to, to build a machine like this. So Einstein called it spooky. He was completely freaked out by, by quantum physics, by entanglement. He didn't like it, and he tried everything, uh, trying to figure out a why, how to prove that it's actually wrong. And why didn't he like it? Because uh, a mechanical object can be in two different places at the, at the same time. So you could be sitting here, but you could also be at home right now. And you too. You could have, have some food at home and, and, and sit here. And according to quantum physics, that actually works. It's called superposition. And, and a mechanical object can be in two different places at the same time. So that's one of the things I, Einstein didn't like. Uh, it can make an atom move forward and backward simultaneously. So if, imagine parking in this little parking spot, and now you're hitting the car in front of you and the car behind you at the same time. So, so that's quantum physics for you. You're tunneling for a solid wall and then entanglement, even, even, even stranger and freakier and, and completely blown people's minds. So what are quantum computers? So quantum computers have actually very little to do with conventional computers. So they form an entirely new technology which is really based on these very weird and strange effects. And, and in terms of development, we kind of in the 1940s, so that we are very much at the beginning of, of, of quantum computing. So when I say 1940s, I compare that to conventional computers, to the first conventional computers we actually built then. So, what can a quantum computer do? Um, it can solve certain problems where even the fastest supercomputer in the world may take billions of years to calculate. So it's not a machine which is going to replace your computer at home. It's a machine which allows us to compute certain things you could just never even imagine computing before. And if you're mathematically minded, then, then the right way to describe it, it changes the scaling of, of how long it we had to take to solve a certain problem. So how do you build a quantum computer? First of all, oops, first of all let's start with bits. So bits, uh, bits are zeros and ones, and they're, they're, that, that's how you encode information in a, in a computer. So a string of zeros and one, that's language. So you can encode a number or words into that, and that's how your computer allows you to save information. 
Now here we go. Now let's now we're really gonna make use of this strange quantum effect that from the bike can be in two different places at the same time, or you could be. So now our bit is zero and one at the same time. So that's a bit strange, isn't it? What does that mean? So let's 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 start with a very cheap memory stick, a two-bit memory stick. So I can write, for example, into my two-bit memory stick zero and one, zero one into that stick. Now for quantum computer, if I have two quantum bits, I can simultaneously encode zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one, all at the same time. Right, let's have a look. So a quantum computer can, can give me four numbers and a classical computer can only do one. That doesn't really sound that impressive, does it? Let's have a look about 100 bits. And I need some help here from the audience now. So 100 bits can uh, encode that many different numbers. And now I need somebody who can help me to say that. Okay, so it's a big number, isn't it? So this is in a, in a in very short why a quantum computer is so powerful. There's two ways you can build quantum computers. One using what's called uh, superconducting qubits. But in order to build a quantum computer like that, you'd have to cool um, your microchips all the way to close to minus 273 degrees Celsius, or to absolute zero. And that's hard, and so this is why here in the UK we've, we've, we've using a different technology primarily to build quantum computers. These are individual charged atoms or ions, and holding these, uh, and each ion then becomes one uh, quantum bit. And so here you, here you are, these are these quantum bits, each bright dot is one uh, trapped ion. And now let me, let me guide you to a very famous physics book. So Tom Clancy, in his very uh, op center novel, um, he's actually lovely, uh, very nicely describing how you can uh, understand a quantum computer. And so I'm using Tom Clancy here to explain this. this. Uh, so Tom Clancy says, you can find ions in webs of magnetic and electric fields hit a trapped particle with a burst of laser light to send it into an excited energy state, then hit it again to ground it. That's your switch. Rows of ions in a quantum logical gate, giving you the smallest, fastest computer on Earth. Neat, clean, and perfect. Now, Tom Clancy is entirely right, besides he, uh, the last sentence, which is a, a lie. As you're going to see in a second, it won't be neat and clean, as you'll see when you look at a little picture in the lab in a second. So how do you trap an ion? Um, this is what you would want to have, some, some forces which all point in the same position. So these are errors, are forces. But there's a very stupid physics law which unfortunately prohibits that. And so we can't do that. So we play, so, so, so somebody came up with this kind of idea to have a shaky potential like this. So now hands up, who, who thinks if I put a ball in there, it's going to stay? Hands up. So who thinks it's just going to roll off if I do that? So hands up, who thinks it's going to roll off? So, so if I be a theorist, I give you equations, but I'm an experimentalist, so we built a little device. Um, so you can see here, so if it just rolls off, if that thing doesn't spin, it's a saddle. Now I'm going to make it spin. Was right. Excellent. Okay, so you can see a spinning potential can actually hold something. That's the physics principle of how we can trap ions. And uh, so this is a microchip. Um, which allows us to produce these electric fields inside a vacuum system, which then allows us to hold individual atoms, which are then the quantum bits. And now you can see why Tom Clancy was clearly wrong. So this is a quantum computer. This is a quantum computer right there, and you can see that's definitely not clean and neat. So any of these things it won't be anytime soon. So there's two prototypes being constructed in the UK right now. One is the 2020 engine, and these are quantum computing modules which are linked by optical fibers. And using this construction, you can now entangle, actually, so this very strange phenomenon of entanglement. Uh, you can tangle an atom, one of the modules, with an, with an atom on the other modules, and then you can make a quantum, full quantum network full of these quantum modules. Um, and the quantum gates are implemented using laser beams. At the University of Sussex, uh, we work on an alternative or a complementary uh, quantum computer prototype. And here we execute quantum gates by the application of a voltage onto a microchip and use electric fields to connect the quantum computing modules. So here we have two modules and, uh, sorry, two, two uh, distinct quantum computing prototypes. And, and 
And so this is in a way the UK's approach to, to really producing these machines, real, real life machines. So, so this is kind of uh, what I wanted to say really. So we have um, a new technology here which can allow us to do certain things for example, to maybe create eventually new pharmaceuticals with this technology or, or help in the financial sector by doing optimizations. So quantum computers will have impact on really nearly all sectors of life, but, but potentially. Uh, but they're very, very hard to build. And, and so here in the UK, we really do this now. We're trying to build uh, these machines. And, and so we're bu building our prototype, which should, which should be completed in around one and a half years. Big machines which can really help change the way uh, we work are still around 10 years away, but, but these steps, these prototypes are really a key step in making these large scale machine happen. And hopefully I've, I've uh, uh, convinced you that, that uh, quantum computers may well revolutionize uh, a lot of things and, and, and so this is why it's really wonderful to be uh, working this right now. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, <Vinny. clears throat> Good evening, everybody. My name's Jo. Some of you may have been expecting Professor Kai Bongs from Birmingham. Unfortunately, he couldn't be with us tonight, so you've got me instead. Um, I'm here to represent the Sensors and Metrology Hub. Um, you'll see Birmingham is one of the partners. There are five other um, original universities within the hub, but we've now expanded that to include 11 universities and over 100 companies. Um, all working together on sensors and metrology using the quantum technologies that we've been hearing about already. Professor Kai Bongs is a physicist, but I'm an engineer, so I'm very glad that I've followed Tim and Winnie, who have explained quite a lot of the physics for me. Um, a lot of the, uh, the sensors that uh, we're working on are based on the, the Nobel Physics Prize from 1997, uh, for trapping and cooling atoms with laser lights. And thank you, Winnie, for explaining <laughs> much of how that works. Um, we also use the superposition principle, where um, atoms can be in more than one place at the same time um, and doing more than one thing at the same time. And then we apply um, interferometry. So um, that's the, the principle that where you have waves that then interact with each other, and the two maximums that interact produce a really, really big maximum. Two minimums that interact produce a really big minimum. So you can get a, a pattern, of, uh, an interferometry pattern from these um, atoms, these perfect test subjects that are doing more than one thing at once. They interact with themselves effectively. And we use that for five main uh, sensing and metrology systems within this hub. That's gravity sensing and magnetic sensing, which I'll go on to in a bit more detail next slides. Um, some aspects of imaging, uh, clocks, so very precise timing, and also rotation sensors, which are particularly good for navigation, for example. There's those five main areas, but actually they can break down even further. So, for example, you'll see the second one along is gravity, but the third one along is gravity gradients. So, you can make a measurement of the gravity at one point, but if you can make a measurement of the gravity slightly next to it, you can work out what the difference is, and that also gives you a lot of information about the environment that you're in. And these little icons here allude to some of the um, billions of pounds of market that we've identified for these sensors from little tractor for smart agriculture um, through to mining and um, many other things that I will tell you about later in the evening if you ask the right questions. <laughs> so I want to tell you just about a couple of things first to whet your appetite. The first is an application of magnetometry um, for looking at the, the physical characteristics of a human brain specifically to help dementia research. And uh, these are little quantum sensors in that rather fetching helmet that the lady's wearing. Um, they're not actually ones that we've developed yet. We've brought them in, but this is being set up to show that what we can do when our sensors are at that right size that we can put them in. Um, and we are developing 
um, at Nottingham University, a system that allows patient movement. There are um, systems currently available for doing magnetoencephalography, or measuring the magnetic properties of brains. Um, and they are a machine that you have to sort of position yourself in, and you're just about allowed to breathe, but nothing more. <laughs> now, if you can imagine trying to get a small child who's got a problem to sit still long enough for that to happen, or someone who's maybe got Parkinson's, or someone where the issue, issue you're trying to examine involves them doing some day-to-day -day activity. You can see that there are limitations with the current MEG uh, magnetoencephalography uh, systems that are currently there. So we're looking at something where you can actually do movement. Um, our next year timetable is hoping to be able to measure a child subject, you know, a child that you tell to sit still, but still a child. <laughs> um, and a longer term aim is uh, table tennis, so that you can actually measure somebody while they're playing table tennis. The next highlight to point out to you is gravimetry. Now, I've got those two rather odd looking people up in the top corner of the slide, just to make keep aware that what, when I'm talking about measuring gravity, I don't mean 9.81, you know, here on Earth, that's approximately what it always is. I'm talking about the very small changes in gravity that are caused by standing quite close to somebody. <laughs> um, we're not at the stage where we can measure that yet, but it's not beyond realms of uh, possibility. What we are at the stage of is being able to detect um, a tunnel where we know there's a tunnel you know so we've got a good idea of what the result is when we're when we're looking but um, that blue tarpaulin covered thing out in the snow uh, earlier this year on the uh, Birmingham University campus was looking at one of the service tunnels under the campus and uh, could detect it it was a bit of a cheat because we knew it was there but you know you can see the dip in the measurements enough to give us um, a, a good sense that we're going the right way. So that's the large version. We're also working on a small version, which goes on that drone. Um, it's, the drone's obviously going to be less sensitive because it's smaller, but the main aim of our hub is to look at um, reducing the size and the weight and the power of these sensors to get them down from Winnie's lab to um, out of the lab and into something where you can actually get it into the, the situation where you want to do your measurements. And the sort of measurement you might want to do is to see what's under the ground. It's not necessarily a tunnel where you know what it is, but is there really another Stonehenge under Stonehenge? There seems to be some indication that there is, but at the moment, well, nobody's going to go dig it up. Um, so we need to find a non-invasive way of looking for it, and that's the sort of thing that we're aiming towards being able to do or looking for oil reserves, looking for water around the world. So we've got, in the right-hand corner, we've got the sort of the big ground-based one. We've got a small drone-based one. We're also now looking at installing stuff in space so that we can get a global picture of where the Earth's water is um, and so that it can be managed and, and dealt with. So that's all I wanted to say as part of my introduction, and I will... Hand over to Steve. Thank you. Thanks very much, Joe. Um, I'm going to talk about the work going on in the quantum imaging hub, Quantic. Um, like my colleagues, uh, the hub consists of multiple universities. We have uh, seven, uh, Glasgow, Harriet Watts, Strathclyde University, Edinburgh University, Bristol University, Oxford, and Warwick, and lots of industrial collaborators, because as Tim says, the purpose of the hubs is not to do more basic science, it is to get technology out there, get quantum technology into use. We focus, uh, no pun intended, on imaging, um, and uh, I think I've got the end slide rather than the start slide, which is not a good position to be in. Yeah, there we go. Right, okay. Um, we're trying to 
see things in circumstances that otherwise are, we're using quantum technology, that are otherwise pretty difficult. Seeing round corners, seeing through smoke and all sorts of other obscuring media, seeing clouds of invisible gas, uh, and seeing through noise or in circumstances where there's, there is much more noise than there is signal, and yet you're trying to get an image out of the system. And I'm going to give you some examples of each of those uh, applications of quantum technology that are going on in Quantic. Uh, as the other hubs uh, do, we use superposition and entanglement. Some of the early examples I'm going to give you, though, are quick wins for us where we've been able to exploit some of the developments in sensing technology where we've got exquisite sensitivity and fantastic time resolution to get information and images in circumstances that otherwise are incredibly difficult uh, to, to, to visualize. And the first of those is going to be about seeing round corners, what we call the hidden object tracker. Uh, we do this in collaboration with a number of companies, but in particular with Thales. And I want you to put yourself in this position, which we've all been in before. If you're a dr car driver anyway, you're driving on a road and something is coming out behind the parked car uh, on the side of the road and you need to stop. Imagine yourself in a position where that's an autonomous car, where it's a driverless vehicle and you're sitting in it. How's that car going to react? How is it going to sense those children coming out from behind that car? And that's why we're very interested in hidden object tracking. Uh, what we're doing here is we're firing a laser down the road, and uh, that laser is going to the, the, the light, the photons, the particles of light uh, that quantum physics tells us all about will bounce off the road, and they'll bounce behind the corner. And they uh, will encounter whatever is around that corner, maybe up to two or three meters behind the corner. So quite sensitive situations. They'll then bounce off that object. They'll bounce off the road again. And we have detectors now that are so exquisitely sensitive that they can measure just a few photons very, very rapidly. But not only that, they can time the amount of time that it's taken for those photons to leave the laser, bounce around those, the corners, off the object, back again, and therefore will tell you how far those objects are away and whether they are moving. So uh, we use uh, an incredibly fast camera, world's fa fastest camera, made by a group of, of, of engineers at Edinburgh University, uh, which can not, it's a single chip which can not only count the number of photons that are picked up in the, uh, in the light that's coming back uh, to the car or to the... Uh, to, 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 to whatever is carrying the, the camera, uh, but can also time those photons with, with great precision. And that enables us to work out how far uh, the object is around the corner, whether it's moving towards us, whether it's moving away from us, and of course if it's moving towards us and we're an autonomous vehicle, we need to stop. Okay, so that's one example of the sort of quantum technology and imaging that we're using and developing in, uh, in Quantic. Second example is about seeing through obscuring media. See, this image here is a picture we took when we were doing some experiments in the Alps uh, with Lockheed Martin, where we were trying to get images through the snow clouds that get kicked out if you're landing an, a helicopter in those difficult circumstances. But the obscurance can be fog, it can be smoke, it can be all sorts of things, including dirty water. Now, the oil industry is very keen to be able to find pipelines and hidden objects and buried objects in dirty water. Uh, a diver needs to be able to find these things so it can do repairs or be able to pick up the track uh, of an oil pipeline, for example. But normally you can't see an inch in front of your nose. So what do you do under those circumstances? Well, we can use similar technologies to the ones that I showed you earlier and looking around corners, timing photons and counting photons to see through all of the mess that you get from that scattering, muddy water. So here's an, uh, a picture of an experimental system that we've been using. It's a water tank about a couple of meters long, and down the end there uh, is uh, an object. It's one of these. <coughs> Plumbing fitting. I went to Screwfix especially this morning to buy one to show you that give you a rough idea of what the size is for those of you who aren't plumbers. So it's a couple of meters long, and of course you can see everything down the end there because it's full of water at the moment, but now we fill it full of, uh, of particles that scatter the light around, so just like mud, fog, smoke, and so on and so forth. 
by using uh, that, uh, that timing and counting technology that I talked about earlier, you can actually pick up an image of that uh, speed fit fitting. And of course, all of this depends on scale. Uh, you may need to see over much longer distances uh, in, in dirty water. That's also possible. Um, but at least this, this experiment in the lab demonstrates what can be done uh, to pick up images of things in situations where you just cannot possibly see. Again, in autonomous vehicles or indeed in any sort of vehicle, seeing through fog using cameras is extremely difficult. And that's what we're trying to do uh, with this technology uh, in the Quantic Hub. Um, how about seeing clouds of gas, invisible gas? Suppose you've got a leaking air conditioning system. Can you see the leak? Quite often you can, might be able to smell leaking gas, but it's very, very difficult to see it. Um, we use a camera, the one on the left there, which we have built uh, in the Quantum Hub. Um, your mobile phone has got millions of pixels in it. And I bet if you could get a camera that had 30 million pixels or 50 million pixels, you would go and buy a new mobile phone just to get that camera. This camera has one pixel, and I doubt very much whether you go and buy one of those in your mobile phone, but it's extremely useful for being able to detect gas and molecules that you can't normally see because we can use an exquisite detector that is tuned to that particular molecule. Um, that has one pixel, as I said, but it's a fantastically sensitive pixel. And in order to form an image, we actually sample the scene uh, many, many times a second, and then use a computer to reconstruct the, uh, the original scene. Uh, and uh, I hope this uh, video is going to work. Um, but if I, whoops, um, I, maybe you can't see it so easily. Perhaps if I press, oh, you should be able to see a cloud of smoke coming out of the pipe. Uh, in that image uh, as a relatively small leak of methane uh, that we can detect using this camera technology that otherwise you just cannot possibly see at all. And finally, a bit of entanglement stuff. If you want to see in the presence of noise, it's very difficult to know whether the, the signal you get is actually a signal, uh, a, a photon that is real and is passed through the uh, the, the object that you're trying to detect, or it's a noise uh, photon, or just a noisy electrical signal in your detector. So what we do is we generate pairs of photons that are entangled, and uh, if you uh, send those out and you pass one of those photons through the object, let's say it's a, it's a, it's a biological sample which is highly transparent, you pass one of those photons through that, uh, th through, through that sample, and you detect both of those photons, if you find there are, those photons are coincident, then you know you've got a signal and you're not measuring noise. And that means that you can pick out objects from otherwise noisy or impossible to see backgrounds. So here is a classical image that is just formed from an object that is highly transparent. It's just got a little bit of contrast in it, and it's formed just by picking up single photons, by illuminating it with single photons. If we use photon pairs so that we know that a, a photon has passed through that signal, we can actually see that there is some structure there. And that, we believe, is going to enable us to do all sorts of microscopy with samples that currently cannot be visualized. So, thank you very much for listening. Our role is to make the invisible visible. Thank you all for that fantastic introduction and uh, taste of what the future might hold. Um, I'm going to hand over to you guys for your questions in a minute, but I'm going to take advantage of being the chair while you think about your questions and ask one question myself first. So I'm wondering, with these quantum technologies, whether what the unintended consequences might be and whether we're ready for the first sort of big quantum technology step. Is there, are there any negative consequences that we need to worry about? <laughs> Winnie's nodding, so I'll let you. Unfortunately, yeah, so, so, so some of you might uh, use the internet to buy things. And what do you, what do, you do um, when you buy things? You, you put your credit card details on that web page and you use what's called RSA encryption. That's a protocol which keeps your things safe on the internet. 
And unfortunately, uh, quantum computers are very, very powerful machines, big scale quantum computers. We haven't built them yet, but we are in the process of building them. Once we have them, they can break, unfortunately, RSA encryption. And, and so this is something where we need to be aware of. Um, so people work already on, on post-quantum uh, cryptography. So these are, these are ways you can encrypt information differently um, and, and keep your information safe. And then there's obviously uh, full-scale quantum cryptography, which is also a possibility, which, and as, as, as Tim said, takes some infrastructures. You have to have lines, but there's ways uh, we are dealing with this. And obviously with the emergence of these super-fast computers, just with the emergence of AI. Uh, it's very important that we understand what these technologies do and, and in that sense keep them available for, for broadly, we don't want just a few companies or intelligence or military agencies to have them, but we want them broadly available so that, that people can use these opportunities and obviously also understand where some of the things are which, which uh, so is there a risk if the Chinese un unleash a quantum computer on the world before we're ready we did, did, Absolutely, there's yeah. a risk. And this is in a, in a way why many countries are investing in quantum technologies. So, so here in the UK, as, as Tim already mentioned, there's a national quantum technology program. Uh, the, Europe has just launched a uh, European flagship. So, so, uh, and so we at UK is part of that. So we, we just got an email yesterday that we got, got funded for that. So I'm very happy. Uh, so, and then all the other countries around the world work on that, and the Chinese, I've, I've, I've just heard a story, they're investing 10 billion uh, pounds in, in just into quantum computing. Um, so, and the US obviously for many years now investi and investing a lot of money into quantum computing. So, so, so uh, the good news is that building a quantum computer is very difficult, and so nobody will have a quantum computer next year. I, I can pretty much fair and square <laughs> say that, because uh, so that's gonna be very hard, but, with more and more investment, quantum computers will become a reality and they may become a reality much sooner than maybe we initially expected. So that's why it's important to understand this. And that's why here in the UK we have this fantastic quantum technology program, which is not just there to develop the technology, but also there to assure that, that, that we use this uh, technology responsibly so that government understands what are the opportunities, what are the threats, you know, what, what is about our privacy, um, what, are, what problems can we suddenly solve and what impact will that have on society? And, and so that's just like every, every technology, a very important step. So, so when I grew up in, in, in the 1980s, I actually learned typewriting on a mechanical typewriter. I didn't have a computer. And, and the computers nowadays are everywhere in our lives and we just take this for granted. Um, but obviously there's also many threats with computing. You all now you've received funny emails and scam, spam, scam emails and all sorts of things. So we need to be aware and understanding with new technologies. And, 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 and so this is for some of why we're sitting here to, to explain to you and, and to tell you what, 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 the, what is the future to hold. I think there is a threat today with data security that you wish to keep secure for 50 years, either for national security reasons or because it's confidential. Because the, the one issue is that if people record encrypted messages today, they can decrypt them in the future. Right. And so that's the issue. I mean, I, I think over time we will move to secure communication systems which are proof against that. But they're not being implemented now as we speak. So there is a risk that data that you wish to be kept <coughs> secure for a very long period of time, even if it's secure today, will not be in the future. So that, that, that's the issue. How, how, how do we transition to, to methods in the future that are gonna be proof against that? And so is the global cooperation here that if the USA is just ready to unleash a quantum computer, they're going to, is there a kind of global network where where people are communicating and saying, right now is the time to transfer your data securely, or you know, <laughs> has, has it been? Is there that kind of coordination going on? Uh, to, to certain, P, Winnie mentioned people are trying to develop new approaches that will be immune to attack by a quantum computer. There is currently, well, they don't call it a competition, but there's currently uh, NIST in the U.S., which is their 
their, well, it's the, the National Bureau for Standards in the US, is, is running this competition where people will come up with new approaches to secure communications that they think will be proof. So if, well, once the winners of that are determined, it may well be that, that the service providers provide our secure communications and Google and everybody else will start using those. And maybe that coupled with quantum secure communication links will give us a framework in the future. But the point is we don't have it today. It's not yeah. here at the minute. What about, yeah, with yeah, I mean, pri Privacy is obviously an issue with the sort of thing we're doing. Mm -hmm. You can see through smoke and you can see through fog and you can see through rain. You can also see through net curtains. <laughs> So, you know, there are, uh, 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 an uh, immediate set of issues uh, get created by the ability to count these photons and, and pick images out of extremely um, weak signals uh, and indeed use computer techniques to identify what, is, what it is that you're actually seeing. So mm -hmm. some of the things I didn't show include the use of machine learning to actually identify who's around the corner. Right. Now, you know, that's great from a security point of view, potentially, but clearly raises mm -hmm. privacy concerns. Okay. Yeah. A lot of what we do and a lot of what is going on in computing, communication and sensing is obviously dual use. Uh, so there are, there are downsides to the point of view of privacy. There are also huge advantages from the point of view of medical imaging and things of that yep. nature. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the sensing is very similar to the imaging. It's, mm -hmm. you know, there's potential privacy issues um, where whenever you find out more about something, you know, there's always that um, a quandary of, does everybody want you to know mm -hmm. more about that mm -hmm. thing? And that, uh, very similar issues to what Steve was describing. Well, if you've got something that can find someone buried in an earthquake, you can use it to find people in, a, yeah. in another sense as well, right? Okay, let's open it up and see what kind of questions you've got. Is any, um, the guy in the blue shirt and then the guy in the check shirt. <laughs> There's um, a microphone just coming down. Hi, thanks for a great talk. Um, my question is really to the whole panel and uh, it's two parts. Uh, one is um, which of the technologies that you've you've spoken about today will will have the greatest impact on consumers and the second uh part is which of the technologies that you talked about today will the consumers first experience in terms of being able to use on a day-to-day -day basis i can give a really flippant answer to the second one <laughs> who's done internet gambling <laughs> Who's going to confess to it? No, <laughs> nobody. Nobody admits to doing internet gambling. Almost certainly if you've done internet gambling, the random numbers that have underpinned that interface that you're gambling on will have been generated by a quantum random number generator. Because you can already buy quantum randomness in a box and it generates random numbers. And, and you can use that in all sorts of fancy modeling and cryptanalysis and that. But the internet gambling companies like to use quantum random numbers so that when you accuse them of, of trying to rip you off, they will say, well, our random numbers come from nature, so don't blame us, you know, blame your bad luck on nature. So, so you can already see one or two little bits of, of quantum technology out there if you look. I think it'll probably be different for, for uh, I'll let the others answer in a minute, but I think it, in, in the case of communications, there is the potential that you will benefit from it directly. As I say, you may have half of a quantum communication system sitting in your phone in the future or something like that. So you might see a direct benefit there, but then there may well be ver rather indirect benefits from a quantum computer solving problems that benefit you. So, so I think which one is going to benefit most is a really difficult question to answer. I think some of the benefits will be much, much more obvious than others because they will be first-hand rather than second-hand. But I think, I think arguing which of these is the most important is a very difficult thing to answer. But I think potentially, uh, as, as a consumer, you, you, you can see benefits from all of these, at least in the long term. I think, okay. Yeah, when you go. I, I, I think most important is use, even using the word most important isn't even that helpful anyway because 
everybody has their own um, importance of what they're like. So if you, um, so, so quantum technologies may provide you with a sensor in your car and that may save your life because you won't have an accident. That is pretty important, right? So that's maybe quantum imaging or quantum sensing. Now, quantum computing, there's, there's some ideas that we can understand protein folding with a quantum computer and what that means is you may uh, find the cure for dementia. In fact, you might, quantum computing allows us to simulate chemical reactions and with that we might be able to find new pharmaceuticals. So that's very powerful applications. But I can almost guarantee you none of you will um, have a quantum computer at home anytime soon with a bit of luck if you work extremely hard, unbelievably hard, um, we're going to have maybe in 10 years time a huge machine. So, 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 so the Daily Mail when we reported our, our, our building plan last year I think had a headline physicists propose football pitch size quantum computer. And while we think we can build it a little bit smaller than a football <laughs> pitch, um, it definitely will fill a very big building. And, and so these machines will be in the cloud. You'll be able to use them <clears throat> uh, potentially if you buy the cloud to log on, but they're very expensive to run. And so we're going to use these machines for worthy problems, for, for things where there's just no other way to find a solution, where certainly your computers at home and the supercomputers you may have access to, none of them will be able to deliver answers. And that's only when you use a quantum computer. So quantum computing is, in a way, a very high impact applications, but certainly not something you're going to use on an everyday to day basis anytime soon. But if you get your credit card out, I think you can actually sign up to a, a quantum, probably shouldn't be called quantum computing service, but um, uh, I'm sure the marketeers would like to call it a quantum computing service, but there are online quantum computers or quantum simulators that you can actually access now. And Tim and I were out in Canada a couple of months ago, a company called D-Wave, which actually makes one of these super, uh, superconducting computers that... Uh, that uh, uh, Winnie was talking about. He's smiling because it is, in fact, they say it's a quantum simulator. But it is a pretty complicated piece of electronics, Tim, is it not? Mm. Uh, all buried in something, in a, in a, in a cryostat, in, a, in basically a, a fridge, which is far, far bigger than the chip itself. It's a great application of cryogenic technologies that are actually sold out of the UK. So brilliant bit of export potential for the for UK. As far as imaging is concerned, um, I think we'll see our gas camera in industry fairly quickly. Um, and the other area is the autonomous vehicle stuff. I mean, the autonomous vehicle industry needs more and more sensors of greater sophistication to find out what is going on in the environment and being able to see around corners. Um, presently, the LiDAR systems that control um, uh, uh, or, or, uh, or find out what the environment is like for a, a driverless car don't work in the rain. They don't work in fog. It's a bit of a limitation, really, <laughs> especially in the UK. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I think some of the technology that we're working on is likely to find itself fairly quickly into, into LiDAR. And in fact, we've just been putting a big project together for UK government funding with companies like Jaguar, Land Rover, uh, and the defense industry as well to uh, see what can be done to enhance these existing LIDAR systems that currently guide uh, autonomous cars around the roads. Joe, do you have anything to add? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with the, the original question of a consumer thing for these sensors. Um, but two things do come to mind. The first is the, the use of um, gravity sensing to keep track of satellites. Um, which I think is going to be one of the first things that actually comes to, say, industry. It's not really industry. It's a little um, very researchy uh, building in the middle of nowhere that currently tracks where many of our satellites are exactly um, for all the... Um, so many things are, are run from satellites at the moment, from navigation and communications and all sorts. Um, so that's one. Another one that's come to mind is the monitoring of the health of Highland cattle, <laughs> which is something that's quite close, and that uses magnetometry to monitor their heart health. Um, so the, the heart is a, it's a, it has a lot of magnetic signals in it, and by monitoring the, the heart of a cattle, you can tell quite a lot about its um, well-being, let's say. 
Um, so we originally started talking to this um, farming company because they wanted um, individual trackers on every cow so that they could find out if they were sort of standing in the corner on their own and not very happy. <laughs> um, and in conversation, it, it came out that really what they wanted to know was if they were sort of happy and healthy and being as a cow should be. Um, and we, we realised that by monitoring their heart health, um, that was a, a sort of a, an, an easier way of, of telling the general well-being of a cow. Um, and it's, it's a nice first tester for us because a, a cow's got quite a, a large measurable heart um, so that's nice in one way but it's also got quite a rough woolly coat you've got to sort of get through and it's in the mud and the wet and everything else outside so it's a nice test environment if we can get it to work well on cows then moving that to measuring humans is a relatively easy step so might we all have our own personal monitors on to uh, keep our Health I, 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 I doubt the NHS is going to pay for one each, <laughs> <laughs> but, but with sufficient um, need, maybe. <laughs> Lovely. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Um, yep. Yeah, thank you very much for a wonderfully structured talk. It's really broadened my mind to the concept of, of quantum technologies. Um, I've been thinking around the issues of computing and the way it's going forward. At the moment, we're, we're basically following Moore's law with the speed of computers, and I don't quite have a clear impression as to the rate of change we would expect with quantum computing. Is it, dare I say, at a quantum leap, or will it follow a steady progression? Um, because of raising, if, it, if, it, if it is a dramatic step change, can we keep pace with it with things like security technologies, or do we run the risk of, say, uh, poor foreign powers uh, basically making our banking system irrelevant overnight? Um, so it's really around the rate of change of this technology. Is it is it going to be manageable? I can I can I can respond to that. Um, so the good or bad news is that controlling quantum effects is very difficult. This is the reason why you can't be at home and here in, in the building right now. Even for fundamentally, quantum physics would actually allow that. So, so quantum physics is very strange. As you, but having said that, as soon as, as anything in the world interacts with its environment, so you interact with the air molecules around you, we become what we call classical objects and quantum physics disappears. And so when, when you build a quantum computer, you have to actually shield in these individual atoms completely from everything around it. And only then these atoms start to behave very, very strangely and suddenly, for example, can be in two different places at the same time. Now, now, for many years, physicists even thought it actually might be impossible to even build such a machine because it's so complicated. And only recently, we've been able to, to, to do things in order to make us believe it is actually possible. One of these things uh, um, we've heard before last year, we've invented a means, a new way to build a quantum computer where we can t replace all the laser beams for, for gate implementations with voltages applied to a microchip. So what I'm saying is that, that uh, it is still, while it is slightly easier to build quantum computers, it's still very hard. And so we have now small quantum computers actually already available. So in my laboratory in, in Sussex and Brighton, we have around four quantum computers. Uh, but these quantum computers can't really do very interesting things. So they can only do, in a way, proof of principle uh, applications where we can demonstrate that quantum physics works and that a quantum computer according to the principles we built, is functional and, and can work. But right now, we have a, a handful of, of quantum bits. What we need in order to build, a, to, for example, to break RSA encryption is millions or even billions of, of, of quantum bits. And so, scientists, obviously, I, I can't really look in, in every Chinese laboratory and, and, and quickly climb over the fence <laughs> or, 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 or somehow... Um, get into some secret American installation where they may build a quantum computer, which I'm sure they do. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, we are one of the world leaders in building these machines, and so we have a very good, good idea how fast things can be done. And, and, and so, so these things are so unbelievably complicated to build that it, it's quite clear that nobody tomorrow or the, the, the day after can build machines which will be capable of, of doing this. And at the same time, our agencies like GCHQ are working very, very hard to ensure that, that um, we are safe, our banking is safe, our security is safe, 
and I think what Tim said, the only real risk is, is that, for example, something which we want to keep um, a, a secret for beyond 10 years' time, that is a real problem. Because if you encrypt something now, but I think, uh, then in 10 years' time, or maybe 15 years' time, who knows? Because we, we are now, even 10 years is a very optimistic kind of statement. So it might be even 15 years till we get to the stage where we can break RSA encryption. And so, so there is actually safety in the difficulty of, of building quantum computers. Interesting. You, you also mentioned Moore's law, and that is beginning to creak for ordinary technology because it won't go on forever. Because if you keep making transistors smaller and smaller, eventually you'll get to one of the devices that he's got in his lab. So, so ordinary Moore's law will eventually give up, and the, the processor speed has now started to flatten off a bit. But at the minute, there's still plenty of capability in ordinary technology, but that is not going to go on indefinitely. Person at the back with the stripey top on. Yeah. It strikes me as what you're talking about is actually with the benefits and the dangers of quantum computing. It's, there's actually an arms race going on at the moment with... Uh, you talked about the Chinese, and we haven't mentioned the Russians yet, but I'm sure they're involved <laughs> as well. But we have America, and we have and Europe, and national blocks and business. It does strike me as some kind of like an arms race. Would you agree? It, that's an interesting term because early, uh, well, actually, part of last year and earlier this year, and and it it hasn't emerged yet. But we, the the whole of this program under was was involved in a big public dialogue exercise, and, and that terminology did come up, that the general public perceived it as that. But uh, interestingly, they thought that was a reason for keeping going, not for not doing it. So, so that, was, that was the view we got back, that clearly there are pluses and minuses to be had with these quantum technologies. But because, if you want to use that term, it, it is a bit of an arms race. Then in the UK, we should certainly continue to do it rather than and let other people do it because, as you say, there is there is significant competition. Yeah. Get it, but I think it's Carl Sagan who said the difference between theory and application is engineering. Hmm. Uh, I, I probably misquoted him, and if he puts me down, he should forgive me. But are we at that stage now? Because what you've talked a lot about the theory of quantum computing, and it's actually. It's waiting for engineering to catch up to be able to implement it. I can, I can maybe say respond to that. So, so, <clears throat> so when I in 2002, when I when I finished my PhD, uh, everybody kind of said you're a madman trying to get into quantum computing or wanting to build quantum computers. And five or ten years later, people still rolled their eyes at me when I when I said we're going to build a quantum computer because there are fundamental reasons why people thought you can't build one. And, I mean, last year we actually published this first blueprint of how you're going to go about building a large-scale quantum computer. And, and may, maybe that has marked a little bit as, as, as a phase uh, change or step change because what we did when we wrote this document, we, we, we didn't, we purposely didn't, or we really forced ourselves not to write in any, any new inventions. We said every, everything must have been invented what, what goes into this blueprint, but money doesn't matter, size doesn't matter, energy doesn't matter, like, you know, but can we actually build one? That was the question. And, and, and the, we, we answered this, and, and, and the answer was yes, and it is now engineering. So, so I, have a, in, I have a group in a physics department at the University of Sussex, but we've just hired two electronic engineers. And we're in the process of, of, of starting a commercial entity because now building quantum computing modules is so difficult that you can't do this in a university research group. So we now um, <coughs> will form a company with lots and lots of engineers uh, who are going to then uh, have the task of reliably making what we've done in the lab on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Now they need to make hundreds of these modules in order, in order for, this, for this to happen. So we exa you're exactly right. We are at a turning point where we now move into very, very solid and heavy engineering, but which now has to be operated by, by the physicists who understand the quantum physics behind it, because coming back uh, to where I started, 
at the end of the day, we need to have the ability to control these very strange quantum effects. And that's so hard, and only the very best engineering allows us to do this to, with a degree of sufficient success that we can now uh, build quantum computers. There are certainly companies that I'm aware of who have an ambition to do exactly what Winnie is talking about in the UK. I can add to that, not in the computing field, but in the census field. Uh, much of the work we're doing at the moment is about um, the lasers. It's about the, the magnetic shielding that goes round things. Um, how to package things so that they are um, isolated from vibration, uh, isolated from the Earth's magnetic field. Um, so it is very much an engineering problem at the moment. Uh, yep, the boy down at the front here. Will quantum computing allow more possibil possibilities for AI? <clears throat> say something about that. So that's actually one of the lower hanging fruit of quantum computers, so machine learning. So I don't know, have you heard of machine learning before? So machine learning is, is in itself a very powerful technology and, and, and so, so quantum computers uh, may allow to, to, to very, 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 uh, uh, very big impact on this. But maybe one thing I should say about applications, and, and I, th I think it's very important to, to, to say that, we, there are some applications we understand, like breaking encryption, some applications we understand like machine learning, but really we are very much at the beginning. We're kind of in the 1940s. So I don't know how many people know how computing started. It actually started with Second World War, and it started with the British trying to break the German Enigma code. That computer, in a way, you can argue, ended Second World War because by breaking the German Enigma code, it was possible to, to, to find that information. So, so that was in the 1940s, yet in the 1980s, coming back to when I started to learn typewriting, it was done on a mechanical typewriter. I didn't have computers. And so in the 1940s, two applications were now on breaking encryption and also calculate projectile motion. That, that was the other reason why people built conventional computers then. And so uh, quantum computers are a little bit like that. The, the way I like to see applications of quantum computers are like that. Everything around us behaves according to quantum physics. So the, 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 the color of this bottle, what happens when I drop this bottle to the floor, everything fundamentally is, can be explained by only one theory and one theory only, and that's quantum physics. Conventional computers are just not powerful enough to exactly solve the equations or to exactly um, uh, solve quantum mechanical problems, however quantum computers are. And so you can see that maybe uh, having a machine which has the ability to understand every other system around you may be quite a far powerful thing. And so we're only just at the beginning of understanding the applications. So, so really nice, you, you know what you're talking about, because qu machine learning and artificial intelligence is indeed one of the applications. But do we know the most important applications yet? Absolutely not. So predicting the future, people are actually terrible. Um, so, so it's really hard to even figure out. But when I, when I was your age, actually on the back of cornflakes packets, like uh, we had like the moon base and uh, I was ready to have a flying car by the time I'm sitting here and none of that happened. So, <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. So, so predicting the future is difficult. But what we know is that, that, that quantum physics is the underlying theory which, which governs everything and, and that should tell us a lot about the applications. Person with the green top. Um, do you foresee any health hazards using quantum technologies in terms of radiations or whatever uh, you know, side effect that the technologies you're developing could, could cause? And my son had another very metaphysical question. He's like, how long is it going to take until we can duplicate ourselves and be two places at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can comment on both. The, the first one, I, I, well, certainly in the com communications arena, I, I think the answer is no. There aren't really any health issues because, if anything, we're using lower light signals than conventional communications, so... So, you know, they're harder to, to, to detect. Not, they're not going to damage things. So I, I think the, the potential risks in the security scenario are to do with information, not to do with anything physical. So, but, but the other one about reproducing ourselves, that would be cloning, and, and there's a no-cloning theorem in quantum physics. That says <laughs> you, you, cannot make, you cannot make a copy. So... so 
So cloning and, and, and is not the same as superposition. It is teleportation. So, so, so I started getting into this. I want to be, become a science officer on the enterprise. So I'll just out myself here. <laughs> so that's how I got in, into studying physics. And, and one of the things we obviously all know is being the app Scotty. And, and, and the thing which, which is really awesome is that now in the lab we're actually using tele teleportation. Unfortunately, only with individual atoms. But we can teleport one atom at a time. So, so that works. But it's completely way beyond any kind of future uh, prediction that you could teleport people. Like, you couldn't rule it out. So, so in principle, it would be possible. But, but the engineering would be just so mind-boggling difficult. Um, and, and, and saying this, building a quantum computer is already hard. So that's another 10 orders of magnitude further harder. To, to, so that will be more difficult. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, eye safety is one of the big issues that uh, you know we have to confront, and that's why we're trying to move to longer wavelengths into the infrared. But that's a, that's a well understood uh, challenge of, of any sort of photonic system. The other, again, the other side of that is that we're starting to experiment with using these techniques for seeing through highly obscuring media to see if we can replace x-rays with photon imaging, with, 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 with quantum detectors. Um, because you can actually see through someone's arm and see the bone in it, uh, if you're able to detect the very, very small number of photons that are transmitted through an organ or through a limb. And that, that seems to us to have a lot of promise in the future. Questions? Guy in the blue T-shirt in the middle there. Um, just wanted to ask about uh, energy demands. Uh, so obviously a lot of um, media stuff about current energy use for modern technology. How, how do you see energy demands for quantum uh, going forwards? Well, I think in the, in the in the communications area, the, one of the things we're trying to do is reduce the transmitter and receiver modules, let's say, down as small as we can to give them exactly... Uh, at the minute, I will admit, the boxes are big and bulky and they're expensive and they will consume more electricity to run than, than conventional communication systems. But in the end, I think they'll be integrated into what we're using already for high-speed comms. So I don't think uh, when the technology is developed to what you would call proper commercial technology, I don't think it's going to have any more, any more energy demands for doing this kind of encrypted communication than the conventional high-speed communication. Most of the energy at the minute in high-speed comms will still go into sending the data and I think the, the, the overhead to exchange quantum keys to encrypt that data is, is, in the end, going to be negligible. So I won't claim it is at the minute, but it certainly will be in the future. So I don't think there'll be any significant extra energy overhead for, for, for the communication side of things. On, on the gravity side, um, I showed the, the drone in my slides. And one of the things we're doing with that, I said it wasn't as, as um, accurate, as sensitive as the big thing in the in the campus um, but we are running it off batteries effectively you know there's n there's no tether to a 13 amp plug it really is a flying thing and um, those those drones it's, it's quite a big one so it can carry I think it's eight kilos but still you don't get a massive battery and all your other sensors and everything else in your eight kilo load um, and we've got a reasonable flying time out of it by um, again engineering um, the, um, the way we do the magnetic shielding, the coils design, things like that, so that we're actually um, optimising the size, the weight, and the power of, of that system. Well, you might want to comment on valves and then yeah, transistors yeah, okay, yeah. and then, so, so I've, 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 I've and then I'm, silicon chips. I, I think I'm the, I'm the bad boy on the panel right now. I guess after all my colleagues can say uh, their technologies won't really use that much energy. Um, in principle, I can start my answer by saying actually because quantum computing is, is what's called, physics is called reversible. That means actually in principle, no energy needs to be exp ex ex spent 
Now, that is a very fierce answer and very misleading, so I'm going to give you the real answer. Um, and that is building a quantum computer will, uh, or operating a quantum computer um, is actually will provide a lot of energy. In and that is because the technical difficult, difficulty of building such a machine to isolate these quantum effects is very, very substantial. Um, having said that, you need to compare that now to the energy spent how to solve this problem alternatively. And if you're a pharmaceutical company and if, if you develop a new drug, um, you may spend three or four years or maybe even ten years um, doing all sorts of experiments and, and obviously spending over this period a lot, a lot of energy. So if you run a quantum computer for, for a month in order to solve that problem, maybe the other way, that will also require a lot of energy, like, like for example, even supercomputer, I don't know whether you've heard, like, you know, um, for really hard problems, people have supercomputers, these are in big warehouses, and have lots and lots of microchips on, on, on boards, and they sometimes have to be cooled by all legs. So the NSA or like big, big research facilities have su such machines. They need a lot of energy, and a quantum computer will fall in the same category. It will also require a lot of energy. But again, it's, it's what you get out of it. You're not going to use a quantum computer and, uh, to play computer games. You're not going to use a quantum computer to do word processing. <laughs> you, you use a quantum computer only if you have no other choice and, and, and if you really want to tackle a problem, you can't tackle any other way. And so with that, the comparative energy consumption may be low. That's the only positive thing I can say here. Uh, but certainly not the absolute. The absolute will be quite substantial. We've got time for one last quick question. Where did you? <laughs> the guy in the yellow T-shirt put his hand up. <laughs> My question is, do, does quantum technology exist in the natural world? So by that I mean, are there sort of quantum mechanisms that nature has utilised or anything that's maybe significant to life processes or, or maybe even brain, brain processes? Uh, if so, are, are people looking for them? Are they being utilised? Uh, are they being... So I can go for it. Yeah. Um, and so absolutely everywhere. So you couldn't see without quantum effects, and you couldn't smell without quantum effects. So there's quant a process called quantum tunneling, and that is critical in, in, in your ability to see something. Um, also, can't you couldn't smell without quantum effects. So these very strange quantum effects are indeed present, and 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 in, in a way it makes perfect sense because our whole world uh, behaves according to quantum physics. But there are certain distinct quantum effects you can you can see just at these two in instances. Also, uh, photo uh, photosynthesis. Photo yeah. I can't never say this word. Uh, um, is is work works using quantum effects. And then you have got a very very controversial area of physics. Uh, where you ask the question: Is these even the, the process in our brain? Is there any kind of quantum effects involved, and some scientists say yes, some scientists say no, and we don't yet have an answer. Well, people are studying the energy capture processes in photosynthesis because nature does seem to be able to do it rather well compared to solar cells that we can build. So people are trying to exact, but understanding the precise role that the quantum effects play in all of that, I think is quite Maybe tricky. Maybe the quantum computer is going to be a great way of understanding yeah. how photosynthesis <laughs> actually works. Because <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is very poorly understood. Yeah, it would be good if we, if we could increase the efficiency of photosynthesis, for example. I think that's a very good example. Like, you know, where, why right now we, everybody has, hears about RS encryption when they talk about quantum computing, but things like what you mentioned is, is may, may just be the killer app because if you can increase the efficiency, suddenly you may be able to solve all, all our energy problems. And, and so this is, I really like your question because it, it kind of demonstrates what, what, uh, how wide of an application quantum computers may well have. And that's, that's surely one of the, uh, things we really, really want to, want to investigate with quantum computers. I mean, something else people are trying to understand at the minute is thermoelectrics. So if you've got a tiny temperature difference, 
across a molecule, can that generate some electricity? So you can basically scavenge energy back from, from stuff that you might think has been lost as heat. So people are currently, and there's no doubt that that would be a quantum process if it's done in a tiny molecular scale thing. But at the minute, people uh, are not able to understand that sufficiently to be able to do that. So maybe a quantum computer will help there. But there are certainly processes like that where if you've got that kind of control in the future, you may well be able to claw energy back that you might have thought was lost as heat. So that would be particularly important in small autonomous devices and sensors and things that you want to run for a long time if you can claw back a bit of energy. So, so people are looking at thermoelectrics as a, as a way forward, and I think the underlying mechanism there is, again, something quantum that people want to understand but don't yet. Well, that's one of the, the selling points of quantum simulation. I'm looking to my colleagues to to back me up here or not, um, that you, you're actually able to simulate a lot of the processes that govern the behavior of materials, chemical reactions, and so on and so forth. So even if we don't get to the general purpose quantum computer, people are really interested in experimenting with the sort of computers and simulators that already exist so that they can start to work on understanding these properties that, if you could engineer them, could bring about huge benefits from a an economic and a technological perspective. Absolutely, it's absolutely correct. Yeah. Right, well, can I thank you all, our audience, for some really fantastic questions. And actually, I do wish we could have carried on for another half hour, because I'm really enjoying the discussion we're having. But unfortunately, we need to finish now. Um, and can I ask you all to put your hands together to thank our experts for coming along today. <laughs>